and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, as we count down to Halloween, we are going to explore a real-life account of a Halloween time haunting in the Welsh Valleys in which a cottage was targeted with poltergeist activity and the lady of the house was, to quote the newspaper headlines, whisked away by a hideous apparition. Yes, whisked away by a hideous apparition. And if that headline alone doesn't send a chill up your spine, nothing will. And so, on that ominous note, to begin at the beginning. And it was just before Halloween, in the week leading up to Halloween in 1893, that a fantastical tale emerged from the Rhondda Valleys, one of the mighty industrial heartlands of Wales at the end of the Victorian age. And it was there that a group of locals were being spooked by hideous apparitions, and one woman in particular claimed that she was quite literally swept off her feet by one particular apparition, as that headline alluded to. She was whisked away by this spirit. And when she says whisked away and swept off her feet, she doesn't, of course, mean that in a romantic sense. This wasn't some kind of Casanova-type spirit. It was quite the opposite. It was hideous and it was terrifying. And it was haunting an area near Tonopandi. In particular, it was targeting the village of Llynapir. And it was there these remarkable events took place and the whole community was gossiping away as a result. And luckily for me, and luckily for you listening, they weren't just gossiping in the streets, they were also gossiping in the newspapers. And that is how I have managed to cobble together the facts for this episode. We have reports from the journalists who went to cover the events, but we also have the voices of the real people who experienced this, wrote it down and sent it in to their local publications. And it should be said, some of them did think it was a load of old rubbish. They were not complimentary about these tales of ghosts in their local community. But there are two sides to every story, and there were those on the other side of the argument who claimed that everything they'd witnessed, everything they'd experienced, was 100% true. And who was right? Who was wrong? Well, let me give you the facts as I discovered them, and I will let you, dear listener, make up your own mind as to what was going on at Halloween time in this particular part of the Welsh Valleys in 1893. And one reporter who was on the scene gives us a very handy overview of how things started there, and it goes like this. Great excitement has prevailed during the past few days at Llyna Pier and the adjacent districts in consequence of startling allegations made by Mr John Dunn and his wife, who reside at Amelia Terrace, Llyna Pier, and also by several neighbours. These persons state that for several nights past, hideous apparitions have been witnessed and unaccountable peculiar noises heard in the bedrooms and other parts of the cottage. So, quite a mysterious start. Several people, we are told, have witnessed hideous apparitions in and around this cottage in Llyna Pier, the home of Mr. and Mrs. Dunn. And people did start to flock there. This was a time when a haunted house could quickly transform into a popular tourist attraction. And it wasn't just the public flock in there, we are told, because according to an early report, the police went there as well. And to continue, the premises have been visited by hundreds of persons during the past two or three days. See what I meant by tourist attraction? They were flocking there. But visited by hundreds of persons during the past two or three days and watched by Sergeant Hoyle and PC Pierce 
and the other constables for hours in the evening. So there's quite a police presence inside and outside this cottage looking for ghosts by the sounds of it, although it should be said in several similar cases to this in the Victorian and Edwardian times, the police were also there to keep the peace because when you have that many people flocking to somewhere, it can get a bit rowdy, shall we say. But anyway, to continue. And we are told that nothing unusual has been discovered by them. On Thursday evening, a well-known quiter, that's a, that's a sport, and a number of footballers stood for some time in front of the cottage, eagerly waiting the appearance of the ghost. And it is stated that the bravest of the football men was suddenly started by an alleged supernatural visitant. So, whatever this hideous apparition or these hideous apparitions was or were, it was hideous enough to spook the bravest of football men. And while I, I haven't double-checked this, I should clarify here as well that in many of these Victorian accounts, the word football often refers to rugby football in Wales, which of course has now just been shortened to rugby. And they don't come much braver than Welsh rugby players in the tough coal mining valleys of the 1800s. So it must have been one heck of an apparition. But it wasn't only brave sportsmen who investigated, and a brave journalist who went hunting ghosts for the local press, a bit like myself. Well, m maybe not the brave bit, but the journalist hunted ghosts for the press bit. And this journalist took with him the local schoolmaster, Mr. Tom John. We are told he was the Welsh representative on the executive committee of the National Union of Teachers. I don't know why that qualifies him in investigating ghosts, but there you go. He took along with him Mr. Tom John, the local schoolmaster, and they tried to establish the facts. And he reported that the house is a four-roomed one with a pantry adjoining one of the rooms near the back door. As we paced along the terrace, consisting of about 20 houses situated on the mountainside, men and women were standing on the thresholds discussing the matter. So we've got a description of the property and the area and when they turned up to investigate the matter they could already find the locals there in the street gossiping away and to continue we entered the cottage and found mrs dunn standing by a tub upon a chair washing some wearing apparel is this the house where the ghost has been causing disturbance i asked yes sir take a chair gentlemen if you please she said we seated ourselves immediately at her request and then she unfolded her strange story. And her strange story goes like this. On Wednesday evening, about nine o'clock, I was standing near the pantry door and suddenly the back door opened and a tall apparition robed in white appeared close by me, right before my eyes. I shrieked and instantly it stretched forth both arms and clutched me tightly. There was no one in the house besides myself at the time. I lost my senses and found myself shortly afterwards in an outhouse. Now, I'm going to interrupt her story quickly here because all of a sudden things have escalated quite a bit. There's a lot going on, but this ghostly figure has appeared. Mrs. Dunn shrieks, as I'm sure most of us would. She starts to think she's going a bit mad. And when she recovers her senses, as she says, she discovers she's no longer standing by the pantry door inside her house, but somehow she has appeared in an outhouse. And to continue, the ghost told me there that he was going to take me away with him. I was dumb, could not utter a word for some time. There he kept me, holding me upon the wooden seat and telling me in Welsh to raise a brick for him. I could not do so. The scones and the few bricks moved and a rattle was heard by me. Then I was lifted up bodily and taken out and raised up into the air and I lost my senses 
again. And sorry again to interrupt quickly, but there's a heck of a lot going on here. But from what I can gather, it's not entirely clear from her description there. But the ghost is challenging her. Well, well, firstly, it's talking to her. It's talking to her in the Welsh language in Cymraeg. And it's also challenging her to to move objects, I'm assuming, with her mind psychically in some way. But regardless, these objects, these bricks, begin to move and rattle in the outhouse, seemingly by themselves. So things are starting to move. There's some kind of activity going on. And then she is lifted up into the air outside. Again, it isn't quite clear how this is happening, but she left the ground and she, to quote again, lost her senses. Now, to get back to the tale, and she says that afterwards, when I came to myself, I found myself by the brink of a pond lower down the hillside, and he threatened to chuck me into the water and drowned me. In taking me there, the ghost had to lift me over a fence seven feet high. So it sounds like this ghost was physically lifting her into the air. And it sounds like he must have been quite a strong ghost, or if it was a hoaxer, a particularly muscular hoaxer, because she gets lifted quite high up into the air, certainly over a seven foot high fence. But this wasn't a one off event. This was the most extreme event so far, which is why people were now gossiping about it. And that's why the reporter with the school teacher had paid a visit. And as she tells the reporter, as Mrs. Dunn says, this house has been troubled by the ghost for nearly seven months off and on. But it is during the past few days, in the days leading up to Halloween, that we have been greatly disturbed. Men living in this locality have been sleeping in turns upstairs for days past for the purpose of getting to the bottom of the matter. They hear the latch rattling and rapping on the doors and noises like the shuffling of feet and the clatter of crockery and they can't see anything. So, not only could this ghost lift people great heights off the ground seemingly fly with them or some manner of ghostly transportation there was also more conventional i guess you could say more traditional poltergeist like activity in the house the rattling of doors and the shuffling of feet and the moving of crockery and to make sure this wasn't just the the wild imaginations of one unfortunate welsh woman or welsh couple she she lived there with her husband of course with mr dunn but they also had men from the local area effectively on a shift system on a rotor system where they were taking it in turns to try and catch this ghost be it paranormal or otherwise because let's be clear not everyone did think this was paranormal but they certainly thought something strange was going on and nevertheless they could hear things and they could see things but they could not catch any culprit, which is why so many people were leaning towards a paranormal explanation rather than a plain old boring normal explanation. Now, one interesting thing to emerge from all of this is the fact that the ghost did speak, did communicate directly to its its victim, for want of a better word. And while it spoke in the Welsh language in this example, it also spoke in a mixture of English and Welsh. Mrs. Dunn always replied in the Welsh language, but the ghost understood regardless. So even if Mrs. Dunn spoke to it in Welsh, it could then answer in English. And one of the things he said in Welsh as an example that Mrs. Dunn claimed he said to her was, my ridey tea thavod gada me, which is you have to come with me, which as we know, she did indeed do, not entirely by choice. I mean, she was seemingly either, if not unconscious, not in her right senses, as she put it herself. And she also says that on their last encounter, just the night before, the night before the journalist arrived, was apparently their last encounter. That was the last time she would see him because he had given her his ghostly assurances, as she puts it, his ghostly assurances that she would have peace in future and that he would not torment her again. So, whatever was going on, according to this bilingual ghost at least, he or they would not be bothering her again, and that was that. Or was it? 
Well, it turns out Mrs. Dunn's husband, Jack, had also been troubled by the spectre, as they put it, and he sincerely believed it was a ghost. And Jack, who was originally from Somersetshire and was presumably in the valleys for work, said that the pond where his wife was whisked away to had been visited by hundreds of people during the past day or two. So these people, they weren't just making this this, this pilgrimage, this haunted pilgrimage to the cottage itself and to the street. They'd also gone to the pond. And while there, we are told, they all marvel at the strength of the goblin in lifting or conveying the landlady over the high fence. And just to clarify something else quickly, the word goblin is used in reports like this interchangeably with words like ghosts and spirits. So we are not veering off into the, the folkloric ideas of goblins. These are not Warhammer goblins. Just another word for a spook spectre or ghost. And whatever it was, Mr. Dunn was convinced that it was paranormal in nature. And while the reporter was talking to the Dunns in their kitchen, they were joined by some neighbours who, we are told, enlivened the proceedings with their own recollection. So more witness reports. And one of them described the assailant as wearing a pair of moleskin trousers. As regular listeners will know, quite a few ghosts from this period were wearing in moleskin trousers. It must have been all the rage in the Victorian afterlife. But this ghost was wearing a pair of moleskin trousers and a white sheet over his shoulders. Now, that's still very much part of the ghost's iconography. Nowadays, the white sheet. Maybe you don't get so many moleskin trousers wearing ghosts nowadays, but certainly the idea of the white sheet is still with us. And while you might be thinking at this point, as many people back then did, well, this description just sounds like a man with a white sheet over his head. Maybe quite a muscular man, maybe a wrestler, but nevertheless, a man with a white sheet over his head. Well, that's exactly what the reporter thought, and he did ask the obvious question. It was not a man, was it? To which he was told no, because he vanished into air all at once, and then appeared before our very eyes and went off again. So, if you want to take this witness or witnesses, they say we, not, not me, we saw this vanish and then rematerialize before our very eyes, and so it can't have been a man. And moving on to another one of the neighbours who described seeing the ghost in slightly different clothing and said that she saw the shadow of the ghost on the wall opposite her house and she thought the ghost was wearing corduroy breeches. So a different kind of trouser wear in the afterlife. And she added that a Christian young man and very religious was one of the men who were sitting up in turns all night in the house. And he had experienced the very same thing as they and Mrs. Dunn had. Now, again, it's a little bit unclear here as to what exactly this Christian young man experienced that was the same as other people and as Mrs. Dunn had. I mean, I'm assuming he wasn't whisked away like Mrs. Dunn, but maybe he'd seen the vanishing, maybe he'd seen some of this poltergeist activity that had been reported. But whatever he saw, whatever he witnessed, he was a trusty religious witness, we are told, and he claims to have seen something paranormal. Now, yet another of the neighbours had a theory as to the identity of the entity. And I know I've joked about the moleskin trousers, but going back to the moleskin trousers, and this witness believed it was somebody who did really wear moleskin trousers when they were in this world, and now that they'd passed over, they were still wearing their moleskin trousers on the other side. And to quote, an old man was taken to the asylum from here many years ago, and he wore ribbed trousers and moleskin trousers sometimes, and I think his spirit has returned to look for a bag of gold, which it is said he left behind. A lot of people have been searching the place for money yesterday. Now, 
As with the moleskin trousers, this is another popular theme from these Victorian ghost stories where when something paranormal happens, these stories emerge from people who assume that these ghosts must be looking for something valuable. Money, treasure, whatever it is that stops them from resting easy on the other side. And this theory had clearly gotten out into the community because people were searching the areas where the ghost had been seen to see if they could find any riches for themselves. And those people were, of course, course, the believers. You wouldn't go looking for treasure if you didn't believe in ghosts. And on the other hand, there were, of course, the aforementioned skeptics. And they didn't come much more skeptical than some members of the police force who found themselves dragged into this. Now, one local PC did talk to the reporter and they said to quote, PC Pierce, Kleine Pier, stated that the pond to the brink of which the ghost carried Mrs. Dunn is about 300 yards away from the cottage, suggesting that the superheroics of this ghost with the big muscles to carry Mrs. Dunn so great a distance wasn't quite so great after all. And also, when it came to the noises and the poltergeist-like activity in the house, well, to quote again, he had been telling Jack, the PC had been telling Mr. Dunn, that the noise he heard in the house at night was not produced by a ghost. But it was no use arguing with Jack because it only drove him out of temper. So as far as this policeman is concerned, Mr. Dunn sounds like someone who is totally 100% firm in his beliefs that this is a ghost and he also has something of a short fuse. And it wasn't only Mr. Dunn that this PC believed was being a little bit over the top, shall we say, in believing that what was going on was paranormal. In fact, he accused some of the other locals of being delusional. And to quote, the delusion has struck in Jack's mind and also in his wife's and neighbours' brains. Strong words from a policeman. The delusion has struck their brains. And he finishes by saying, in that a very large number of people have visited the premises and remained outside the house until a late hour in the evening. So whether you believe the locals or not, at least the policeman is corroborating that whatever was happening, a heck of a lot of people were descending on this cottage and the surrounding area to find out what was going on. But it wasn't only the police who thought they were deluded, to quote the policeman once more, they also brought in a doctor, a Dr. Jennings. Again, they don't explain who Dr. Jennings is. It's assumed that you must know. I am guessing he was the local doctor, say. But Dr. Jennings also visited and described the whole affair, according to PC Pierce, as a pack of nonsense. But the matter is, nevertheless, the topic of the day in the district and had caused a great sensation among the residents. So once again, we've got people like the doctor dismissing the entire affair as nonsense. And yet the locals refuse to change their views. If they won't listen to the doctor, if they won't listen to the PC, well, an even more senior figure from the police got involved. Police Sergeant Hoyle, who wrote to the paper to deny any knowledge of any of this ghost hunting stuff that was going on. And to quote Police Sergeant Hoyle's letter, he wrote that, While reading a copy of your paper this morning, I came across my name in connection with the ghost story, as having watched the house, which is supposed to be haunted for several hours. Now, as I only knew for the first time through reading your paper that there was such a thing at Lonapier, I wish to emphatically deny the statement with regard to my watching the house in question, as neither I nor any of my men have been near the house. Which, as far as denials go, that's a pretty strongly worded denial. I think we can safely assume that Police Sergeant Hoyle was not at the house looking for ghosts. Now, of course, we know that there were 
police involved. We had those earlier quotes. But certainly, Police Sergeant Hoyle was far too busy for this rubbish and did not want his own men wasting their time helping out. But despite this, Mrs. Dunn remained adamant that it was all true and she herself then replied to the newspaper with what is described as the authoritative version of the mystery in which she expanded on some of the details of the case and explained the long-term effects of the experience and if you've been paying attention all the way through this episode you might notice a few little differences, some contradictions in this authoritative version of the mystery to what was reported earlier in the papers. Not not major changes, but there are some slight differences that you might pick up on. But this is her authoritative version, and it goes like this. I am the woman who was carried away, and I am the woman who can tell you the truth about it. I have plenty of witnesses who have heard the noise and I had plenty of company in the house when he, the ghost, took me away. And she does stress the fact that this isn't her alone. There were witnesses and she even tried to get one independent witness with some authority in and to continue. They asked the constable who looks after the company's houses to stop here a night to hear and see for himself if he could, but he did not come. But nevertheless, she still had other witnesses. And to return to the tale, I was sitting on a chair by the fire with three other persons, Mrs. Lewis, Mrs. George and John Samuel. The company was outside. It was at half past eight in the evening, as near as I can say, when the ghost pulled me off the chair towards him to the passage. I was afraid and I screamed and jumped back to my chair. He was still there. Mrs. Lewis told me to speak to him. I felt too nervous at first, but after a time, I started to speak to him when, before I could finish my words, he pushed me out from the house and across the bailey and into the water closet. Here, he lifted me onto the seat, standing, and he pointed to the top of the wall. He told me in Welsh to raise the stone and take what was under it and that I must go with him. That was all he said to me. Then he took me down about 200 yards from the house. I cannot tell you how he took me from the closet because I lost all my control. I found myself by the brim of a pond. Here he took from me what I had in my hand and threw it into the water. Then he told me he should never trouble me any more. So that's all the truth and i hope you'll be so kind as to put the truth down in your paper and of course they did indeed put that truth down in the newspaper because that is what i have just read to you but that's not quite the end of her letter because she does finish by explaining that as a result of all these strange events she says that I am not able to do the washing nor anything else. I am not the same woman that I was before, and I don't think I ever will be. These events, she claims, have literally changed her life and not for the better. And to wrap things up, she says that I can give you these names and many others who can swear to what I've said. And here she lists the names and the addresses of the people mentioned earlier. And if that isn't enough, she can supply them with more. And that letter, as far as my research is concerned, really does mark the end of the affair. After what she referred to as the authoritative version of the mystery was published, the ghost, or at least the reports of the ghost, dried up. There were no more mentions of this ghost in the press, which might suggest that Mr. and Mrs. Dunn were then left in peace. Or were they? Because with the police sergeant himself wading in, telling his men not to investigate and accusing the press of printing false information about the police as far as he was concerned, Victorian fake news, what 
editor would want the hassle of printing further developments if there were further developments in a story that was hardly groundbreaking news. I think there's a good chance the editor took one look at that police sergeant's letter and said, you know what, let's knock this story on the head. It's just not worth it. But that does mean, of course, that if the ghost did return, how would we know? And if it did return... When did it return? Was it a a seasonal thing, maybe? I mean, it first appeared in the days building up to Halloween. Now, Halloween in the 1800s was a totally different holiday to the way we see it now. This is a long time before America put its stamp on things and gave us this wonderful celebration that we have today with pumpkins and spirit Halloween and candy corn. And yes, I do like candy corn. And yes, my shipment from the States did recently arrive. And I'm looking forward to tucking into it after this episode. But first, back to the Victorian age. Back before the invention of candy corn. Well, I I assume before the invention of candy corn. Certainly before the invention of spirit Halloween. And back to Halloween, or Norse Kalangayev, I should say. The Welsh Halloween on Norse Kalangayev, the first night of winter. And I would love to tell you all about the Norse Kalangayev celebrations. But sadly, we are nearing the end of this episode. But the good news is I've already recorded many, many, many episodes all about it. I've got episodes about Huch the Gutter, the tailless black sow that would chase children home at night, and the lady when the headless white lady, and the Welsh Jack O'Lantern, Jack O'Lantern. There are countless episodes. Well, maybe not countless. Maybe it's about 10. But if you would like to check those out, you can go back to last October where I dedicated the entire month to Halloween. And I did exactly the same thing the year before that if you want even more. And of course, the next episode is also going to be another spine chiller for Halloween. And if you don't want to miss that or any other upcoming episodes, be sure to hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode ever. And as always, if you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, you can treat me to a coffee via my website. I do like my coffee. I do particularly like my pumpkin spice latte at this time of year, so I'm sure that's what I'll get myself with it. But you can treat me to a coffee via my website. Or if you'd like to support the podcast for free, which I know is the best way, then please consider leaving a quick, nice review or giving it a quick thumbs up or five stars or whatever the options are on whatever platform you are listening to this on. If you'd like more Ghosts and Folklore, you can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram. And as well as a podcast, I've also written many spooky books which are perfect for Halloween and which are available from all good bookshops offline and on including Ghosts of Wales accounts from the Victorian archives, which is where I first published the tale on this episode. All of which just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Rees. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. Until next time, stock up on that candy corn and happy Halloween Norse Kalan Gaev Hapis and Nostar. No